Any of you guys remember this game? You know, we've been playing, sort of revisiting a lot of these old World War II first-person shooters, particularly from the PlayStation 2 era. And by complete and total accident, I discovered this game, rediscovered, I should say, this game that I think, well, I really like it because there's great squad chemistry. You're, you're in one squad from beginning to end. You see the evolution of the squad from beginning to end. You're fighting enemies that aren't just the Germans, but yet it feels natural because of the campaigns in which you're fighting. I've come to the conclusion that it has to be one of the best World War II FPSs ever created. And that game is Call of Duty 2, Big Red 1. I want you guys to escort those engineers. Just provide support. Don't do anything stupid. I need you alive. What makes a good World War II game, in my humble opinion? Well, as a historian, I look at gameplay secondary to the world of the game itself. Uh, something that I look for is not necessarily historical accuracy within my within these games. What I'm looking for instead is what I like to call historical authenticity, kind of like the show Rome, for example, where the events that happen in that show aren't exactly historically accurate, but you've got the right costumes, you've got the right language, you've got the right colors. You got it feels historically authentic. Babylon Berlin is another great example of this, where it's not historically accurate but certainly historically authentic. And that comes with games. And games, naturally, it's much harder to be historically accurate just because of the nature of what games are. The other thing I look for are characters. Do I like whom I'm playing with? Do I like the people that I'm fighting alongside? You also need to have something of a story. Is there one? Uh, what happens? Uh, what needs to be achieved? What's the overall arc that we're going to go through on this game? Something that a lot of people like to overlook, especially with their war games, is also atmosphere. I think atmosphere is unbelievably important in setting a mood and tone of your game. Call of Duty World at War, I think, does that in droves, sort of turns it into a horror game more than anything else. And I think that really fits with the tone that that game was trying to tell. And it's one of the big reasons why I still say the game Medal of Honor Frontline still holds up so well. It is one of the most atmospheric games ever made. Now, out of all of those things that I just listed, there's only one weak spot with Call of Duty 2, Big Red 1. And that is the story itself. It is basically nothing but a series of small objectives. There's no overarching story here at all. Instead, in terms of the writing of this game, we have an extremely character-focused story of how a squad in the Big Red One grows and changes from the North African campaigns all the way into Germany itself. Now, most COD games from this era, and indeed after it, tend to jump from theater to theater to theater. And I, I should actually say more like fronts. Suddenly you'd be on the Eastern Front, then you'd be in North Africa, then you'd be with the Americans, sometimes you'd be in the Pacific. It jumps all over the place, right? This is the only COD game that I can think of from this era, where you stay in one POV with one squad from literally the beginning of the game to the end of the game. And I love that. You care about these guys as a result. I don't need to be reminded who they were. I knew who Kelly, Hawkins, Bloomfield, uh, Denley, and even Captain Delaney. I knew who these people were because you're with them from beginning to end. Be okay, son. Now, most of the voice actors, it helps that they're really good because a lot of them were actually, uh, you know, side characters from the show Band of Brothers, which was made at around the same time. Uh, and the voices feel very natural in the in whatever environment that they're trying to be in. Um, they sound scared. They sound concerned. They, they are telling quips and jokes all the time to try to lighten the mood. And it's even evident from the very first level that these guys are absolutely great at what they're doing. The first level is called We've Been Through Worse. And we notice here that there's a character named Bloomfield who, right from the get-go in this level, seems unbelievably angry and grouchy at this new guy, this new man in the squad named Alan. Now, Kelly sort of acts as a, media, a mediator in this argument. Uh, Alan is extremely uh, excited to go off and fight and use his M1 Garand. Well, Bloomfield is like, no, it, it sucks. You shouldn't be excited for this, and I can't believe you would be excited for this. And Kelly has to kind of be this this moderator. Get a load of him. Why do they keep getting these guys? Give it a rest, Brooklyn. Yeah, fine. You collect this dog tag. Well, what's he sore about? I just hey, said. Hey, look, replacement. Just because you got that patch on your shoulder, don't mean you're one of us. Dome 
find him, Alan. He lost a lot of friends in France. We all did. But we notice that there is a deep, dark demeanor throughout the beginning of this. And then at the end of the level, you are thrown from a building, and who hovers over you but Bloomfield? And Bloomfield is almost in a complete panic that you've been hurt. And what I adore about all of this, and this just these two bit of interactions, right, is it establishes that these guys know each other, right? Right from the get-go. They've been through worse, right? It establishes that these men have been through so much together that they've had each other's backs basically from beginning to end, though we don't know the extent of that yet, and establishes who's alive and who isn't, though we don't know that yet. There's a certain character that isn't here that is very prevalent, or two characters in particular, that are very prevalent in the previous parts of this game. Now, the next level jumps all the way back into the uh, Africa campaign uh, called Baptism by Fire, which is a very apt title. And we see a guy named Sergeant Hawkins, and he's not in the first mission. And now we also see, who's the first person we hear? It's Bloomfield, that same guy from the previous mission. And he's instead here being a, he's wisecracking, he's making jokes, he's also a bit arrogant. Yeah, Storm in the Beach was fun and all, but I gotta get back. I got tickets to the Yankee games, they're playing the Red Sox, I got box seats. I shut the hell up, Bloomfield. I said, can it? Resistance or not, we got an airfield to secure, Private. And for Christ's sake, Kelly, watch where you point that rifle. Try and remember that. It'll keep you from blowing the head off the guy next to you. Not the same man from the previous mission, right? And also, if you look at the uniforms, they're all clean. The characters are all clean, shaven, and everything like that. A vast departure from what we saw just within the previous level. So we know where we're kind of going with these guys. That they've been together all the way back since Africa. And it isn't until the level of... Uh, that's called an easy detail, which is in France. Do we know why Bloomfield was acting the way he did within Mission 1? That's amazing. I love that level of detail in the writing. It's very simple, but unbelievably effective. And that's because we lose Sergeant Hawkins. Let's go on me! Here's a man who had been shot several times working with us before and somehow pulled through. He's been that grounding presence that has kept you sane. And these characters together, from the beginning of this game to now, suddenly we lose him. And by the time we lose Hawkins, we feel this emptiness within the squad. Now, it's first established with the death of Denley and his BAR. He is the guy that held the Browning automatic rifle. Uh, you know, he's always constantly, you know, bantering with Bloomfield. Myself in front of an entire platoon of Frenchies. Took them all out, every one, by myself. That story gets more ridiculous every time you tell it. You know that? Hey, it's true. It's one of the highlights of the of the game up until this point, until we reach the level in Sicily. It's the final level in Sicily called Farewell to Friends. That title is very ominous already, but uh, it comes as a shock when he gets it. And, and when Denley dies, he's the first member of your squad to get it. You, as a player, find yourself kind of mourning for Denley. And a lot of that comes from the lack of banter now between Denley and Bloomfield, between him and Bloomfield, that sort of friendly, like, two brothers fighting kind of deal. It's suddenly gone. I still can't believe it. That son of a bitch. Selfish, mean-spirited bulldog was the toughest soldier we had. And suddenly the squad, after Denley's death, feels a little bit more hollow. Like a piece of your squad that just can't be filled no matter who goes there. And it gets amplified when Sergeant Hawkins finally gets it. Now, he doesn't die, but he's been horribly hurt, and he's no longer in your squad. And as a result, past an easy detail, that level, the remaining levels within Big Red 1 feel unbelievably hollow and routine. Now, some people I've seen in reviews have kind of said that as, you know, sort of lazy writing, that it starts to get kind of boring and stuff like that as the game goes along. You're just going after objectives here and cleaning out a building here and blah, 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 blah. It gets kind of boring. But suddenly when I was looking at this, suddenly I realized, oh, that's the point. These next three levels that happen after an easy detail, they are unbelievably fun, unbelievably challenging, and near impossible to be on hard mode. But from a story structure, without Denley or Hawkins, they feel, you feel kind of aimless. You're now a sergeant, 
by this point. You've replaced Hawkins, essentially. But you feel a little aimless. You feel a little lost. And it's almost like you're just slugging through to the end of the game. And I believe, truly, and from a writing standpoint, that that was the purpose of it all. You're supposed to feel that way. Because every time a member of your squad gets killed, you feel a little bit more hollow as a result. By the end, the final level, Bloomfield himself gets killed. And now when you look at your squad, you realize, oh my god, it is just Kelly and myself. That's it. The nerd with the glasses who was always screaming for Medic. Medic! 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 He's the one that ultimately lived the longest. And, and because of this, the game just ends. Right? There's no big mission at the end. There's no big fanfare or anything like that. The game just fades to black and it's over. The end credits start rolling. Damn fine job, Sergeant. You do this division proud. You're left with this hollow feeling in your gut that this will only continue until the entire squad, including you, are dead. Shot at here is still better than selling shoes for my girlfriend's dad back home. Over the course of 14 levels, you learn who each of these people are, what their quirks are, what makes them tick, what they do to bring the squad together as a whole. Each character kind of plays a part in making the squad what it is. And as they all start dying, your squad starts dying with it. You feel significantly more hollow. And it's a tremendous level of atmosphere as a result, right? That each character in the squad matters. Uh, that it's not just because you like them, but because you need them to be alive. That each level gets more difficult the less squad members that you had. Which, speaking of atmosphere, that I want to talk about Medal of Honor Frontline very, very briefly here. Because to me, that is the gold standard of atmosphere in a war game. And the soundtrack for Medal of Honor Frontline is one reason why that atmosphere is so powerful. Uh, the two ones that come to my mind are Rough Landing and Arnhem Nights by Michael Giacchino. Stunning pieces of music, but when you play it within the game itself, it's it's haunting, to say the least. It, uh, to me, it's just lacking in today's first-person shooter games, particularly the World War II games. Now, Big Red One takes a different approach and it rarely uses music at all. There is a score to this game, but it's very minimalistic, and it's only it only appears here and there. So unlike Finest Hour, the previous Call of Duty game that I would play, which has an epic and rousing score just on the first mission alone, the music here within the first mission of Call, of Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1, it just kind of fades away into the background until all you hear are people shouting and gunfire. And all the missions are like this in Big Red 1. And it works so beautifully. One example is um, Piano Lupo. The level Piano Lupo, which is the second level in Sicily. The atmosphere I just adore. You're running through caves as they collapse. The slow erosion of the bunkers as you're trying to defend them. The long moments of quiet as the squad moves between one fight to the next. It's also just got some fantastic sound design, and that's always key in implementing a good atmosphere, and just, it comes out in droves within within Big Red 1. You know, the constant distant battle and low rumbles, particularly in this level, absolutely fantastic at establishing an atmosphere that you are one part of a giant machine. You also have another one, which is the last level of the Africa missions, called Counterattack, which is my favorite level on that one. And essentially what happens is you're established at the beginning that you need to cover this medical kind of field hospital. They need to withdraw. You need to cover their withdrawal. And so the opening, you kind of hear a little bit of rumble here and there. You certainly hear the wind and the sand all blowing right. all over the Get place. Around, boys. Just got word from battalion. The Germans are mounting a full-scale counterattack to retake this village. Slow down, cowboy. So then you run off. You fight your little fight. And then towards the end of the level, you're coming back through. And you realize that you are now where this hospital was. And suddenly it is completely empty. That's it. It's just the hollow desert wind. And it is brilliantly atmospheric. And it just sells me on this world. It sells me on what we're doing here. It immerses me in this world more than a lot of modern games do. 
so historically, this game isn't overly accurate. As I said before, accuracy it kind of takes a step back compared to authenticity. I do applaud the D-Day mission for not just copying Medal of Honor or Saving Private Ryan. I gotta say, it's not accurate at all to, to what the actual Omaha Beach actually was. And a lot of this comes from the nature of playing a first-person shooter. Uh, you kind of have to over-exaggerate a lot of stuff because that's the nature of what type of game you're playing. What I love is the assortment of enemies that you fight. And this is what I mean by historical authenticity. This, as far as I know, is the only game that I think that is based in World War II where you actually fight the Vichy French and the Italians. I could be wrong, and if I am wrong, please comment below and tell me what games I uh, also have that. But in fact, that, when I was, because I was really young when I played this, introduced me that it wasn't just us versus the Germans, right? But a plethora of different Axis powers within Europe. You know, it introduced me to Vichy France and even Mussolini's fascist Italy. And the fact that you fight the Italians and the French, right, before you reach the Germans is genius because it also builds up the tension to when you finally are confronted with Rommel's Africa Corps. It's, it's absolutely genius because the first major enemy you fight is the French in Africa, then you fight the Italians, and then you meet the Germans for the first time and you are almost overrun and slaughtered by oncoming Panzer IVs and Tiger tanks. Sars, they're right on top of us! Armor, heavy armor, and it's, it's, a, it's an intense introduction to the Germans. And it's built on both anticipation and the dread that the Germans were the real toughies. These are the guys that we really need to watch out for. These guys, the Italians and the French, they were just a test to what's coming. And it pays off, it, and, I, and I really applaud it for that. I like how throughout this game you don't see any random King Tiger tanks in 1942, uh, but mainly Panzer III's and Panzer IV's. I like the assortment of guns that you can choose from during the campaign, too. Uh, no pistols, which I've always found kind of interesting in a lot of the, like, the Medal of Honor games. I always loved how you could pick up pistols, not so much in, in this game. The ability to aim down your iron sights, too, was also huge, I remember as a kid, being thinking that was so cool, because I remember in the Medal of Honor games, you just kind of zoom in a little bit. And this was also an era before political correctness really started to, you know, taking a hold within the industry as well. You see the right type of swastikas, you see the right type of uniforms, the iron, and, you know, that's something that always kind of drove me nuts, is that German flags in World War II are plastered all over the place, but they're not the right flags. They, instead of having the swastika, they have the, the German Iron Cross, which just isn't true. It always makes me wonder why make a historical game if you can't even portray it that way. Not the case here. This was before any of that was a big deal. The only problem that I kind of have within this game that actually gets rectified in Call of Duty 3 is that a lot of the German uniforms rarely change. They look the same from beginning to end. There's no real evolution besides some of the snow uniforms that you see later on. And this is a time, too, where you still have health packets, you know, which become rarer and rarer and rarer as the game progresses, which makes it more challenging, more difficult, and sort of adds to the intenseness of each and every level as you go. The, checks point, the checkpoints get sparser and sparser, too, as you go along. Awesome little touch. And the game as a whole starts off really easy. I mean, it even says in the title, we've been through worse, right? But suddenly, it gets extremely hard and difficult the closer you get to Germany, which I think is a wonderful touch from a game design standpoint. The Germans are now getting, they're, they're fighting harder because we are now threatening their home. They're fighting harder, therefore it's much more difficult to beat the levels themselves. The, the game, I'm not saying that this game is perfect at all because there are some problems such as the slow aim and stuff like that, the low FPS and stuff like that that we're used to, to today, some really jittery animations at times, and, you know, a lot of those are typical problems that we have from PlayStation 2 era games. But on the whole, you know, accumulating all those positives together, I'm, I'm easily able to look past that. As, as I said before, gameplay itself uh, tends to take a backseat with me. And taking into account the, the level design, the characters themselves, the overall story, the voice acting, the lack of music, the atmosphere, stuff like that. It was an absolutely wonderful rediscovery on my part. And me suddenly realizing that, no, this isn't just nostalgia talking. This is an amazing, amazing game. And having now played through Finest Hour, a few of the Medal of Honor games, and the other, you know, console level, uh, console era, P PS2 era, COD games, and even PS3 era, suddenly I realized, wow, 
I think there's something special with Big Red One. And why I can sit here now and say it's one of the best, if not the best, World War II first-person shooter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you went down a little bit of a nostalgic road, kind of like I did, uh, revisiting this, and hopefully I brought you some joy. I'm not exactly a gamer, <laughs> so forgive me if my lingo was completely wrong. Anyways, uh, all my social media is in the description below. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button. I'd love to have you. Uh, in the end, this is Adam Noise of AM Productions saying, Sayonara. <laughs>